Our scripture lesson comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew, beginning in chapter 13 at verse 24, reading through 30, and then skipping down to 36 through 43. Listen for God's word for you this morning. Before Jesus, or uh, he put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sows good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat, and then went away. So when the plants came up and borne grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not grow good seed in your fields? Where then did these weeds come from? And he answered, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds you will uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at the harvest time I will tell, uh, I will tell the reapers, Collect the wheat first and bind them into bundles, uh, or the weeds first and bind them into bundles to be burned. But gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds and the field. He said, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. And the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one. And the the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send down his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and evildoers, and they will be thrown into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Let anyone with ears listen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We're in a section of the parables of Jesus. Uh, The parables were, as we talked about, one of uh, Jesus' favorite techniques for teaching. Uh, They convey to us uh, what he understands the kingdom of God to be, and as he teaches us about uh, being a part of God's kingdom, about weeds and wheat uh, put into the field. Weeds uh, are, are something that bother all of us. You know, if you work in your yard at all, you, you know that weeds can be uh, quite a problem. But depending on where you are, what counts as a weed can be very different. Did you know that in California, they have a long list of weeds, official noxious weeds, and one of those is baby's breath. Now, how many weddings have you ever gone to that had baby's breath as a part of a floral arrangement? Probably an awful lot of them, if not the majority of them. Did you know that in Kansas, it's not just some, you know, West Coast California thing. In Kansas, in their list of official weeds is the oxide daisy, that beautiful white daisy that uh, all of us think of is listed as officially a weed in Kansas. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, uh, a weed is a plant whose virtues have yet to be uh, discovered. Others have said, a plant growing where it is not wanted is what makes it a weed. A weed planted, sown in the night in the field that the sower had had planted. all of them surprised when the harvest time came and they found so many weeds among them. The sowers, good and bad, I think in a way it describes for us human nature, doesn't it? Um, that each of us are created in God's image, that we're created uh, as God has, 
has intended for us to be, created good. Um, we hear that in the first chapter of the, of, the, of the Bible, the first chapter of Genesis says, you know, each day that uh, when the world was created, it was good. And then when humans were created, it was very good. Um, but we know it doesn't take long, just three chapters in, the third chapter, we've managed to mess it all up. Uh, human nature, human sin has come into the world. We are fallen, and we know that well. We know our brokenness. We know uh, sometimes we're capable of such good, and yet other times we're capable of just being downright rotten or not very thoughtful or considerate. Um, our, our life is full of sin and brokenness created in God's image and fallen. A year or so ago, I served on our uh, board of ministry, and um, we were kind of doing a primer as we knew all the uh, candidates for ministry were going to be coming up, and so we took on some topics to have different clergy uh, teach on to the board so that when we came into these conversations with uh, our new candidates, we would have you know, at least been practice on some of, the, of our doctrines of, of faith, and so uh, they were assigned out. Everybody was assigned different ones to, to work on, or, well, a few of us were, were given an assignment to bring a, uh, a teaching session about a particular doctrine. I was uh, given the doctrine of sin. That, that was mine to come and for us to talk about. Somebody else talk about the Trinity or talk about something else. I was assigned sin. And in the letter that went out to everybody, it, it came out this way. Um, it says, we would like you to teach us about the doctrine, and then it was the, the blank spot, mine, the doctrine of sin, because of your expertise in this area. <laughs> you know, I, I, some, you know I, I wish I were, you know, about a human goodness, that would have been nice, you know, about the Trinity, about anything, but, but your expertise on sin. You know, I, I did not let that go. I had to make the best of it, you know, so I gave our chair a, a hard time about, you know, how he selected me for that. But, um, that's the, but, but maybe we all have an expertise in sin. Maybe it's just a part of our, our, our nature and our brokenness that we have messed up along the way. Um, and it comes and it's not always, you know, it's not, I, it's not axe murderers, you know, sin all the time. Uh, I, I'm, I'll tell you this at least once a year. I don't worry about you going and knocking off the corner convenience store. Uh, but sin works into our lives in ways that, that um, can, can be insidious, like weeds that grow up and just tangle themselves into the whole of who we are. Um, I, I think the great sin of our society today is, the, is, is our inability to talk to each other across lines. We draw our lines and, uh, and we just can't even hardly talk to each other because we're so angry about what we feel, our missteps of someone on the other side. Um, I, I think that's the great sin. In fact, um, a theologian had said, that maybe the, the, the easiest way for the devil uh, to work his work in the world is to set good people against each other in conversation and debate. Doesn't that sound like our world today? I mean, <laughs> good people set against each other. Um, we've gotta be able to look past and, and, and get to the, the place that's bigger. And it might mean being the bigger person sometime and not letting yourself be pulled off track by someone else's insistence on whatever you think is a conspiracy or valid, invalid view or thing like that, um, to be able to just let that go so that you can deal human to human and be able to work our way through. We live in this field that is sown with good seed and bad seed. And um, 
we may think we're the good seed and find out we're baby's breath growing in California or a daisy growing in Kansas. Um, we may think that we are on track and yet we're the ones who are off track sometimes if we, um, if we allow that kind of divisiveness to be in the heart of who we are. That can be the sin. Um, I, particularly about the scripture, I think about it though all the time during the season of Lent. Um, just the question, what do you want, what do I want to accentuate in my life? And what do I want to diminish? Because what we feed will be what grows. If we feed discontent in our life, that's going to be what grows. If we feed uh, goodness and kindness and love and compassion and grace, then that's going to be what grows. Uh, several, many years ago, I, I used to, up into the time I was in college, I'd mowed yards in the summertime, lots of yards. Most of the people I mowed for were little old ladies, but every once in a while I would get a young single man who was, I was working for. And I had this guy who I'd mowed his yard. It was a terrible yard. I mean, it was mostly weeds. He didn't like it. I didn't like it, but, you know, that's the yard he had. And he, he really wanted to do something with it. What he wanted to do was just have, have someone come in and just kill all the weeds. Um, if he had done that, he wouldn't have had any yard left. I mean, it was most of the yard. And so I finally talked him into, well, you've got patches in all these places of, of good grass. Why don't you focus on growing the grass? Let's, what, let's do that rather than trying to get rid of all the weeds. We can take care of the weeds later. And do you know the reason why? Because whenever Bermuda, at least, when it thatches over pretty good, it doesn't leave a lot of room for weeds. I mean, uh, you know, we can, when you get to that place, then you can work on getting rid of the weeds. But in the meantime, focus on growing the good grass. I, I think that fits with this parable. Uh, Jesus is not anxious to send them out to yank up all the weeds. Um, says that'll be God's job in the end, right? I mean, it's that God who is in charge of the harvest. Um, it's not our job to yank up all the weeds. Um, we can not feed them. We can let them diminish while we grow the good grass. I mean, we are to be the people of the harvest. We are to be the wheat. Um, and we want to feed that, but we want to let the weeds of life diminish. Let them grow together, he said. Focus on growing the grass. Steve Harmon uh, was, was a CVS reporter. Um, he admitted on air one day that he'd become uh, obsessed with weeds and weeding. He uh, would leave his job at home. He would come home and he and his family would have dinner together and he would go into the yard and start pulling weeds. And he would pull weeds until, uh, until nighttime came when the sun went down. And then he would come in, his kid's already asleep. He had three young kids and his wife frustrated that you know, he was never there with them. He was always at work or weeding. Uh, he had five acres, and so you can imagine what could be spent. He had decided he had created this idyllic image when they bought this place of this, uh, this field out in front of their house that had been uh, just full of weeds. He imagined it with all native grasses and plants and stuff. So he was working on that, but he thought he had to get rid of all the weeds before he could uh, get to the point of putting in the, the good plants. And he realized he was... Um, neglecting the most important garden of his life, uh, those kids and that family, uh, so he could pull the weeds in that, that yard. Um, it's easy to get sidetracked, to be uh, pulled aside if we focus on just eliminating the negative, get rid of the negative. Um, it can be hard. Number of years ago, in fact, I had talked to one of uh, these kids um, 
say kids, they're adults older than me, but um, just about a year ago, the family matriarch had passed away, mom had passed away, the kids were not handling it well, they were fussing with each other, and at the time, um, I'd learned a lesson from a minister who had said to me a long time ago, is that, that moments like that, we have to decide what is it we want to grow and feed, and what do we want to let go of? What are we going to hold on to, and what are we going to let go of? Um, and I talked to him about that. I said, you know, I know y'all are upset. You seem bothered with each other. You got to decide what is it you're going to hold on to and what you're going to let go of. Because if you want to hold on to discontent, that's what's going to stay. If you want to hold on to the good and let that discontent go, then that's what will happen. But it's your choice. It's your decision. The person shared with me, they hadn't gotten total peace with it yet, but they were closer than they had been. Um, they decided to let go of some things that, that they were holding on to and they really felt like should be in the other category. What are we going to hold on to and what are we going to let go of? Um, St. Augustine talked about the church as the corpus per mixtum. The corpus per mixtum. The body corpus uh, mixed together. Um, that's, that's who we are, the church. We are the body uh, mixed all together. We're the field planted with good seed and bad seed. And, um, and God is the one who brings about the harvest and calls out the good. I used to think this parable was about good people and bad people. Now I think it's about the field and each of us are both. We're both the good seed and the bad seed. We are uh, both all that God has created us and intended for us to be and all the brokenness that falls short of that. Knowing that that's the case and knowing my own life that there are so many sins and weaknesses and brokenness in me that holds me back. Um, I've learned to move away from being afraid of God's judgment to welcoming it. Come, Lord Jesus, uh, bring the time of harvest and purge away anything that within me that would keep me from being who you really intend for me to be. Purge away any bitterness or feeling of, of in, uh, discontent. Um, burn away the sin so that only the good wheat of the harvest will remain. Pray that you take an opportunity today, unlike that family, you know, whenever we get to a moment like that, it can be a moment where we really choose to, to do something different. There are moments that can be that kind of touchstone moment. Um, but we don't have to wait for that kind of day. We can make today be one of those. We can make today be one of those days where we will choose to grow the good seed in our life and to not feed the seeds of divisiveness and discontent. Let us be the good soil. Let us be the harvest of wheat that God will bring in. Amen.